general. So yes, today it's, well, it's really three things. I want to talk about internet carbon in general, runaway data usage, um, in part caused by uh, profligate web design, and then what we mean by CO2 aware web design, how we can actually make a difference in our, in our just sort of general front end design work. Now, I've had a lot of this uh, talk, um, a lot of a prep work for this talk done for me by Chris Adams's fantastic talk earlier. If you haven't seen that one yet, then do rewind. He, he gets far more into uh, the, the real detail of the carbon context of, of what we're talking about, both in terms of uh, overall greenhouse gases and how that relates to internet infrastructure. So I won't spend too long on this section, um, but perhaps it would be valuable just to look at it again uh, from a more sort of macro perspective. When we're talking about internet and carbon and the future and humanity, it's all big, scary numbers, millions and billions of people, billions of tons of CO2, changes and effects that are going to take decades or centuries. It's pretty hard to visualize and make kind of relevant to our work. Um, I came across this work recently uh, from a company called carbonvisuals.com. They do some nice work in visualizing what carbon actually means. So this is sort of fairly persuasive material um, or relatable material in terms of trying to understand at a, a sort of visceral level what we're talking about when we're talking about a, a ton of CO2. So those are some tons of CO2 cheerfully bouncing down a, a rendered New York city street. And here is uh, New York, so oh, sorry, Manhattan's annual carbon emissions, 54 million metric tons piled up there. This is what, it makes a nice striking visual. So this is part of the context of what we're working in. How do we go from that to a billion tons of CO2? Well, if you take uh, New York and times it by 18, that's a billion tons of CO2 a year. So let's just represent that with a square. And maybe you can guess what's going to happen here. We're going to fill up the screen with squares to get 33 billion tons of CO2. And that's what, uh, as a species, we put out uh, back in 2013. And as Chris was pointing out earlier, a lot of this is, uh, you know, it's, it's highly unsustainable anyway. Uh, you know, we've got a sort of a notion of a safe to spend amount in terms of carbon that we can, uh, that does get recycled by the biosphere. Everything else is just accumulating steadily, driving up those parts per million. So that's kind of a big picture of carbon as, as I see it. I want to zoom down. What's, what's the internet share? Again, Chris had the, the, the good visuals on this, but uh, just in terms of like little slices, on well, the internet share, how big is it? Well, how do we get to that? First of all, it's, it's, doesn't seem to take that much electricity to send a web page or to use the internet or to, to charge your phone and so on. But you've got to consider the amount of people using the internet every day, uh, how much they use it, and the, the types of infrastructure that powers the whole shebang. Um, so two, two and a half billion global web users right now. We're expecting another billion uh, over the next few years uh, until everybody's wired up. 70% of us are online every day. Four billion hours of YouTube get watched every month. So there's a lot of a lot of people consuming a lot of data, particularly that video data. Netflix, YouTube consumes such a huge proportion of uh, bandwidth, uh, particularly here in America. And all of that's uh, powered by this very energy-hungry infrastructure. So data centers, standard data center there. Um, I don't know how many racks that is, but uh, it's got the same uh, power signature as a small town. Um, and this lovely object here is a 3G tower disguised as a tree. And that's putting out 100 kilowatts, 100 kilowatt hours, so plenty of power. And you've got to remember, most of this is still being powered by fossil fuels, uh, especially in the developing world where the internet is growing so rapidly. Uh, in the States, it's a bit more of a mixed picture, um, as that uh, uh, Greenpeace Clicking Green report that was mentioned earlier outlined some of our internet infrastructure is moving over to sustainable power, some of it's still lagging behind, cough, Amazon, cough. Um, so anyway, this gives us a bit of our big picture. So if you bear in mind a huge number of people using the thing and uh, the fact that it's coal powered, it's maybe less surprising to find out that we've got this headline attention grabbing number of 330 million tons uh, of internet related carbon, or if you want to cut it a different way, 830 million tons. Go back to our picture grid here. It's a big chunk of one of these squares. And it's a growing chunk as these extra billion people uh, come online. That's just going to continue to extend. So there we go. That's that's what I see. That purple area I see is has been kind of our area of concern. You know, these other squares on here, uh, perhaps they're partly the responsibility uh, directly of consumers or 
of the cement industry, which is something ridiculous, like 25% of all worldwide CO2 just comes from making cement, uh, or agribusiness, or cars. But the purple bit, well, that's kind of where it gets really relevant for us. Now, of course, this doesn't mean we want to abolish the internet. Uh, it's, it's impossible to imagine life without the internet. Even Greenpeace, who, who do publish these very critical reports about internet power use, uh, don't want to abolish it. Uh, we just were, and after all, it's also displacing previous polluting exercises, as this web conference shows. Um, but we do want to try and, you know, use our portion of uh, global energy in a much more responsible way. Um, so that's my sort of takeaway there. So how do we relate that, though, all these big scary numbers? How do we relate this back to pushing pixels around in Photoshop or uh, publishing, you know, our latest um, uh, Tumblr about animated cats or whatever? Uh, how does it relate? I'll try and show how. So couple of things going on here. So number of people going online is increasing. The amount of data that is being consumed is increasing as you know we demand higher and higher definition videos. Um, but just even prosaic web design uh, is getting more and more data intensive. Um, let's sort of relate this back to a web page uh, quickly. How do we actually count carbon for web pages? So the way I do it, and this is all very back of the napkin, um, is you look at the amount of data used for a page times it by the number of people who are using that page. And then you work out what sort of power is generally powering the data center uh, and the internet infrastructure between you and uh, your users. And this gives you a rough idea of your uh, site's footprint. So leave that there for a moment. Let's skip over to look at these pages that we're actually sending down here, that, that first item, the data per page. So what we've seen is we've had 23 years of technology progress in web design. Uh, when monitors have got bigger, broadband has got faster, uh, and our development tools have gotten better and better. And people's expectation of what a website should look like has changed as well. So if you think about what a web page used to look like uh, versus what it looks like now, well, your average web page now wouldn't fit on a floppy disk. It wasn't always the case. If you go back to 91, first web page there, uh, uh, the, 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 the web page describing the www. Uh, that was a 2.4 kilobyte page. And if you were back on the web back then, this is a sort of fairly typical web page back then. No images, uh, really no markup, uh, and the result is a very tiny data footprint. Go to 2015, and you see far more of this kind of thing, uh, a typical e-commerce site for a fashion brand. And the average web page size here is 5 megabytes. So if you think about it as a sort of general trend, you see that data generally has increased massively from these smaller figures to uh, the average today is what well, smaller than the Oakley, but the average just today is 2.4 megabytes per page. So one and three quarter floppy disks uh, to hold just one web page worth of images, data, and so on. So a real explosion there. So if we go back to thinking about uh, the carbon footprint of a web page, you can see that it's, in decent data terms, going up and up. But in another relatable way, uh, we used to design little bicycle websites. But these days, our websites are rolling coal. Now, I feel I should probably try and explain that for our European audience. In America, there's such a virulent strain of uh, climate change denialism that some people have taken to adapting their trucks to burn coal. Uh, you know, the dirtier the coal, the better. And uh, you see these things driving around um, with uh, a big pipe bellowing uh, black smoke. And what they like to do is they like to pull up in front of a Prius at the stoplight and, and uh, belch these fumes everywhere. They, that's absolutely hilarious. Uh, but yeah, we could argue that we've been doing slightly the same thing with our web design as well. So let's try and relate that data footprint back to the actual carbon. So these are the best figures I've been able to dig up so far on what data means in terms of carbon intensity. Now, hopefully there's some better figures out there. Uh, Chris uh, showed us some an awesome wall of uh, stats and figures earlier. So I've got to talk to him after this and see if he's got uh, and more up-to-date figures. But the, num the numbers I was able to get uh, suggested that wired network energy is about a cost of three kilograms per s of CO2 for each gigabyte that you send. So you think 2.4 megabytes for a web page doesn't go into you know, a gigabyte that many times. You're only serving a few hundred web pages before you've emitted three kilos of CO2. Uh, wireless is much worse, or at least it used to be, uh, I know the telecoms industry is working very hard on reducing this figure um, because, of course, uh, uh, 
uh, it's costing them a huge amount of money to, to use that much electricity. But it used to be the case that a gigabyte of data sent wirelessly was about 35 kilos of CO2. Uh, I really want to find a more recent figure than that. So if you have one, please let me know. So if you take that, if you take the carbon per gigabyte and the number of users and the data, then you can start to footprint a website, uh, albeit in a very approximate way. Uh, so this is my kind of back of the napkin um, in general. So assuming that you're living in a fossil fuel state uh, as I am, then a small website with say 3000 page views a week, if that weighs 2.4 megabytes, that gives a carbon footprint of about eight tons a year, maybe. Whereas a huge site like Tumblr uh, hypothetically has a carbon footprint of over 2000 tons a day. And what we're talking about here, when I want you to visualize that, I want you to think about those data centers uh, and that sort of array of uh, palm trees uh, that are really 3G towers beaming out um, uh, gigabytes upon gigabytes of data. Uh, I'm not even talking about the electricity that's uh, needed to power your computer. Now, of course, hopefully Tumblr doesn't really have a, uh, such a catastrophically large carbon footprint because quite sensibly, they'll be using a lot of green hosting, uh, carbon neutral hosting for their data centers. But still, it gives you an idea of the, some of what's on the table. A quick takeaway here, data intensive website design at 2.4 megabytes leads to uh, a, a larger carbon footprint directly. So it gives us a pretty strong hint of what we should be doing here, right? Uh, less data by this equation means less CO2. And that's what the second half of my talk is going to be about. But before I dive into that, I want to make a quick digression. Um, as we heard in uh, Jen's talk, it's not all that easy to simply persuade people uh, to your point of view. So if you're going into any kind of a redesign and you want to make an argument for redesigning a site for to reduce its CO2 uh, and make it leaner, well, you might be met with some skepticism, shall we say, particularly here in America. Um, you might be lucky enough to be operating in a, a, a circumstance where the corporate social responsibility people uh, would be firmly in favor of such a redesign. But there's a good chance you're going to run into one of the 30 or 40 percent of uh, Americans who um, are kind of against the whole thing. So you're going to need some other arguments. Um, and I'm going to give you four quick arguments which kind of make data, you know, reducing data more of an attractive proposition for businesses. So here's our digression. Firstly, reducing data, uh, reducing the, uh, the page size of your websites. Uh, has a tremendously positive impact on performance, KPIs, and the bottom line. A few quick uh, headline stats here. Um, a lot of experiments have been done by uh, the larger internet players to sort of to sort of uh, A/B test uh, different designs of their pages and see how uh, different amounts of design uh, or, or, or different uh, um, different amounts of data per page affect the loading speed. Um, and of course, the more data on the web page, the slower it takes to load. So here's some figures that uh, have been released. Um, there's, a, there's a great event every year, uh, Performance um, uh, by O'Reilly. It's, it's a web performance uh, focused event. Um, and a couple of years ago, they released these figures. And Bing uh, had carried out an experiment to just artificially slow down their homepage by two seconds. They immediately spotted a 4% drop in revenue. Amazon famously uh, found that by slowing down by even a tenth of a second, they could directly correlate that to a 1% fall in sales. If you're a you know $70 billion company, then that's a, a $700 million problem for you. So uh, that's a very expensive tenth of a second. Mm -hmm. Etsy are always experimenting with performance. Um, they added a 160K invisible image to their mobile sites and immediately noticed a 12% increase in bounce rate. So, uh, and Shopzilla and so on and so forth. So. Very important to know that speed is a competitive advantage. Um, uh, the slower your site, uh, the more people uh, bounce off it or leave it and the less time they spend on it and so on. So reduce the data, speed up the site, you're saving carbon, but you're directly affecting the bottom line. That's really all the argument you should need in most cases. Uh, just a couple more though, just to make it irresistible for the, for the bosses and the people signing the checks. Um, got to think about the impact on mobile as well. So data intensive pages are kryptonite for mobile. Phone browsers are just slow anyway. It takes an extra couple of seconds to open that connection. You're getting an extra third of a second extra latency, just bouncing data back to the back to the cell tower. 
And uh, here in America, at least, we're a mobile nation. 71% uh, uh, of mobile users are encountering slow speeds on a, on a regular basis. 30% of us are mobile mostly or mobile only. Uh, going back to uh, some of the thoughts about inclusivity we've had today, mobile is the internet for a large number of people, particularly the young and the poor. So you've got to have a fast website so that it's even a tolerable experience on mobile. And great, you're saving carbon as you do it. Uh, mobile is taking over, by the way. Most people, most sites are going to see more traffic on mobile than on anything else. So we have to optimize for them. Uh, a further point here is um, we're saving our, our clients money here too. Uh, again, on mobile, if you're unlucky enough to live somewhere with uh, metered broadband, mobile broadband, um, then uh, this handy site, what does my site cost, will tell you. What accessing just one web page of that would cost on a typical plan? So I ran it against The Verge, popular technology blog. Their average web page size, four megabytes. So uh, if you're in Germany, that's potentially costing you 50 cents just to look at one web page. Um, fast opens markets, another good story here from YouTube. Uh, YouTube a few years ago realized that uh, they're sort of, they'd, they'd been letting their web experience get just too overloaded with uh, with features and ads and so on, and their, their page size was going up and up, and it was kind of costing them users. So we ran an experiment to build a lighter weight version of YouTube. Uh, they made it only 250 kilobytes, so less than a quarter. And what they found was they were suddenly getting traffic from parts of the world they never had traffic from before. We're talking sub-Saharan Africa. We're talking Mongolia, places with uh, very poor internet infrastructure. Now, those users were not necessarily having a fast time on the site, but they were able to actually access the site, which they couldn't do before because that uh, that one megabyte page uh, just took too long to load. So uh, a very good reason um, uh, to optimize their uh, accesses new markets. Google, Google are going to penalize you for having a slow website or a data intensive website. They started doing this back in 2010. Uh, they rate sites uh, in search engine rankings partly by speed. Um, so uh, some are reporting uh, post-optimization that uh, their sites are speeding up by about 20%. And then lastly, you know, and, and if I'm talking to clients, I've, I have to admit, I still usually put the, the climate change argument last. Slow sites are filthy sites, at least in climate terms. Just pause there for a second. So five good reasons uh, that you can use to help persuade business owners to optimize their site and thereby lower carbon footprint. OK, so how do we actually do that? How do we actually reduce the carbon of a website? So there's a number of ways. Um, I'm certainly going to hear about green hosting. And we heard a bit about that earlier. So one way of reducing your footprint, uh, obviously, is just to move your site to a green host um, so that uh, all that server energy is now uh, being powered by renewables. Uh, which is great. It doesn't take away the, the all the energy that's used in the sort of transmission of your site. So the network infrastructure between the server and uh, the end user. And particularly that's, as we had, important for mobile users. But it is a great start. So the next thing to do after going on to green hosting is to start thinking about uh, smushing the data. How can you reduce the data on your site, speed it up, get all those fantastic benefits of a faster site, and um, and then you're saving carbon as well. So I normally tackle this in a, in a sort of five-stage process. I'm going to skip a couple of steps just in the interest of time here. But you start by looking at how data intensive you are now and see whether the easy savings are, where the low-hanging fruit is. Uh, you go about formulating a strategy for future design work, so leveraging things like design principles um, uh, in your uh, client um, in your client persuasion materials to to sort of govern things like performance. Uh, technology, there's a few technology investments or, or, or techniques that uh, can really help reduce the data of your site. And then the stuff where we live, uh, the UX people, live, the site planning, site design, interaction design, visual design, and so on. Uh, I'm going to race through the first couple here. Uh, Research-wise, well, a couple of quick things you can do just on, on any given website. First of all, stick it into Google Developers, uh, Google Page Speed Insights. That will give you a rough score of uh, how poorly optimized your site is. Um, and it'll suggest some immediate things, which, uh, if fixed, will speed up the site and reduce data usually as well. Um, of course, you can always just right click on a web page uh, and inspect, and then you can see that sort of headline figure there 
uh, of how big that page is, how many um, requests it makes there on the left is another important consideration. You want the fewer requests, but the better. Uh, and uh, back in the old days of the web, you might just have you know HTML and a few images, and one web page would just be a handful of requests. But now it's in the hundreds. And all of that means more pinging back and forth on the network. We also have access to uh, green-specific benchmarking tools like EcoGrader, uh, which will also give you a score. And it's going to be it's also going to take into account things like green hosting, but also all the other aspects here, uh, like uh, how well optimized your site is. So lots of tools out there. And again, I've got to defer to Chris Adams. He's done such an amazing job collecting resources here. So refer back to the materials he's been posting. Uh, for a really more comprehensive list of uh, useful tools for, for doing this type of benchmarking. Let's talk about technology a little bit. So this isn't a technology conference per se, but uh, there are an awful lot of poorly optimized websites out there which are not running the latest um, optimizations. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is new. This whole issue of web performance optimizations really only kind of burst into the forefront in the last few years. Uh, so there's a lot of old websites which haven't benefited from that. So this could be something as simple as running the 23 basic optimizations. That Google uh, link I sent you earlier, uh, showed you earlier, um, will actually sort of test your site to see if those things have been done. Most of these are sort of fairly inconsequential changes to the code. Some of them are more substantial, but all of them uh, will reduce um, the overhead on your site. Uh, follow the, the experts, so people like Scott Gell will are uh, really sort of forging this stuff forward. Uh, this is how a typical web design shop these days deals with their front end. They minify, they optimize images, uh, they concatenate, uh, they sprite, they use SVGs, and so on. We'll get into a bit of what some of those things are there. So most of this, uh, these technology issues, you just need to kind of prod your front end developers and say, hey, this benchmarking tool saying, you know what? We're not, we're not, we're only scoring 50% out of 100 for, for website optimization. Can we please speed this up? Um, and it's always a very popular kind of uh, rectification work to do because everybody likes a faster website and you always get lots of praise and kudos from uh, the site owners and bosses for, for speeding things up. Some issues, though, some technologies are a bit trickier uh, to get your hand on, uh, to get your head around and, and might need more of a rethink. I'm talking about the responsive image problem. So uh, we saw on one of Chris's slides earlier that a huge amount of this growth in data needs for websites uh, comes from the images. You know, we've gone from uh, small images to uh, needing images that fill up the big monitors, retina-ready images, and so on. Uh, result being a huge amount of the data on that, you know, two to three megabyte average web page is just images. And a lot of those times, those images are wasted. A uh, very, very common problem is that uh, people are serving desktop-sized images uh, to mobile phones and just sort of squishing them down. So um, uh, this guy, Tim Cadlick, uh, uh, sampled, uh, I think it was 100 average web pages and worked out how much data was being wasted by uh, not squishing images or not resaving images correctly for mobile, which is a pretty easy thing to do these days. And uh, he found, yes, yeah, sure enough, uh, hundreds and hundreds of kilobytes were, were being wasted that way. Um, another tool you can try yourself, Super Sows Me. Uh, you put in any website, and it will tell you um, if it's running images, which uh, need to be optimized for mobile, and what your potential savings are. And remember, if you make these savings, you're really helping uh, that 30% of people who are mobile mostly. You're helping them the most, because they're, they're, they're suffering the most from um, these excess images that you're serving them. So uh, University of Vermont there, uh, this page on desktop takes for over four seconds to load. Half of this page is images. But on mobile, it's still serving the same images. It's not um, serving a, a mobile-specific one. So uh, very wasteful. Let's skip over this. So a few minutes left here. I wanted to get to um, the more UX-specifically focused material here. So just a quick shout out for personas here. Uh, now that we're thinking about performance and design more, um, we need to really start thinking about our particular users and their data needs. So what somebody's experiencing on an old feature phone on a, on a, yeah, out in the boonies somewhere um, with, uh, with poor connectivity is going to be very different from somebody who's sitting at home uh, with uh, fast broadband, um, or even somebody who's got a, a few generations older smartphone and is on Wi-Fi and so on. So 
uh, important to sort of consider that each of these people is going to have a different experience, not just with the device, but with the loading time of your site, given their specific network conditions. So how do we kind of bear their minds and need, uh, their, bear, their, bear, bear their needs in mind? Um, one way, very popular technique um, amongst uh, people who sort of geek out on this stuff, uh, as I do, is the page budget. So this is the idea of designing your website with size in mind from the get-go. You actually set a target size in kilobytes and megabytes for how big you think your web page can be. If you're trying to serve uh, people on, on weaker uh, networks, um, a nice, fast experience, you can pretty much work out uh, how many kilobytes your website can be uh, so that that experience is fast for them. Um, so you kind of guess that and then um, work backwards. So you end up with a figure. You end up with a figure of, say, 800 kilobytes or a megabyte or, or whatever. And then you try and work out what you can afford with that budget. And this takes a bit of practice. Um, but once you've uh, done a couple of websites where you started to really measure um, the cost and data of each individual element, it becomes pretty much second nature. You start making these trade-offs in your head. You start thinking, well, for this page, if we have a nice typography with nice web fonts, that's going to take up most of our budget. So we can't afford quite so many images. Or you might go, well, it's really key that I have this one product image. But that means I really can't afford that much JavaScript. So maybe I can't do all the animations or, again, web fonts that I wanted to do in this situation. And we'll look at some examples of people doing that in the real world in a, in a few. Uh, so if you think of how we wireframe now, uh, if you start just adding kilobyte estimates to your wireframes, you quickly get the idea of what things are going to cost you. So here's a, a traditional um, you know, sort of static web view here uh, with a carousel and some sub-product images and some uh, JavaScript-powered social sharing buttons and so on. You can count all these things up. And oh, surprise, surprise, this one comes out to two megabytes. It's too big, too big for uh, our page budget. So we go back to the drawing board. Um, we throw out all the photography. We start using vector illustrations instead. We don't really need those social sharing buttons. We could just use uh, simple links. Carousels, well, no one really clicks on the second and third images there. So out that goes, and so on. And now we've got something that operates within our budget and loads an awful lot faster than the old one. So turn over to Tim Cadillac there again. If a new feature exceeds the budget, you've got three options. Optimize it, remove it, or don't have it. So let's talk about how we make some of those decisions there. I mentioned carousels. I hate them. Um, turns out that people don't really hate them, actually. They're just indifferent to them. So. Uh, on most websites, uh, this is the common pattern for a carousel. The first image gets clicked, the rest of them do not. Uh, we have carousel blindness the same way we have uh, banner ad blindness. Um, so uh, just generally avoid them. There's very, very few circumstances where a carousel is really going to gonna work for your needs. So um, given that I have this argument on pretty much every project, what I tend to say is, well, you know, we can we can test it. The default is you shouldn't have one, but you know, we can always try and test to see if uh, a carousel is actually valid for this approach. If you've got to have a carousel, then make sure at least it uses a lazy load so that um, it's only loading the images it needs uh, when it needs them. Share buttons. That's another uh, bet noir of mine. Um, if you if you use the standard libraries for the interactive Facebook, Twitter, discuss whatever buttons. Um, they're only little graphics, but they load an awful lot of JavaScript. It can quickly add up if you're using one of the, uh, the fancier sort of aggregated um, uh, button styles. I'm just going to pause here for a time check. I think I've got about 10 minutes. So you can simply get rid of those buttons by doing what a list apart do, just uh, have them as common hyperlinks. It works just as well, uh, people find, but they really speeds up the page. Uh, Google and uh, Facebook and so on lose some of the tracking. Um, oh, no, what a shame. They can't serve quite so many ads. That's a shame. Uh, another quick one, not necessarily obvious, embedded maps. Um, still see some people put a, an interactive map on the footer of every page. Don't do that. That's about 400 kilobytes of images and scripts each time. So you're really blowing the budget there. Autoplay video. No, don't do that. I'm going to skip that one. Um, visual design, lastly here. So we talked a bit about interaction design savings we can make. But let's talk about the, the aesthetic layer of a site. 
really non-obvious thing uh, to most designers I speak to. Um, save for web in Photoshop is broken. It's not what you should actually be using to uh, save out imagery for the web. Uh, there are much better third-party tools for optimizing images that uh, really increase uh, savings a lot more. So I pointed one at the Pennsylvania Ballet um, just to see how poorly optimized their web pages were. You just uh, you can point it at a URL of uh, this size, uh, uh, this tool called Kraken. It'll suck up all the images, uh, see if it can make any non-destructive optimizations, and then give you a saving. So that one web page there for the ballet was 1.3 megabytes uh, just in images. Um, after we uh, uh, crush it, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's nearly half that. It's a huge saving. Uh, so don't trust Save for Web with Photoshop. In fact, most modern uh, web design workflows account for that. And if you're using your Gulp or Grunt or, or Bower or one of those tools, it should take care of that for you. OK, so that's the basics. Um, let's get ready for some more radical change here. So uh, what do we expect uh, from, from a modern website? Often these days, there's a lot of identikit design, huge full bleed photos, or even you know autoplay full bleed videos with high ret uh, high um, density retina, etc. Um, so, well, one thing we can do, we can tackle that in a number of ways. Uh, all those huge images are using a huge amount of data. Let's go mono. This is one of my favorite things to do, and you see a lot of websites now taking this sort of you know more artsy approach. Uh, we can we can just strip out the color and go to a single color. Um, and that makes a huge difference. And there are subtler things we can do with art direction here as well. Uh, this is my friend Garrett's uh, old cat. I've been using this photo for a few years now. Um, handy technique you can use is you can selectively blur uh, the non-focal point parts of a photo, uh, and that will really reduce uh, the data size uh, of that picture. So by going black and white and doing some blur, you end up with a 100K image instead of a 200K image. Another great technique. Use illustrations instead of photography. Well, stock photos are kind of easy to, to get, of course. You know, there's lots of cheap sources for those. Illustrations can cost more, um, mm -hmm. but they're really worth it in terms of reducing page size and conveying personality in a better way. Um, again, in the interest of time, I was going to talk a bit about uh, the doom of uh, high retina, uh, high uh, DPI screens, um, and why they mean uh, we need to switch to vector. Um, but I think I've just said that entire argument in that sentence. So what I was going to say is vector is always a lot smaller than photos, and it scales brilliantly. So wherever you can, use vector images instead of bitmap images. And this is particularly relevant as devices get more and more uh, fancy large screens. Um, you know, you think you need to serve a 4K image. Well, you don't. You could serve a vector, and it would work really well. Vectors, particularly SVG, work fantastically well for icons now. Um, and they even animate. I don't know if this will work uh, in our context here. Um, and uh, if you want to start thinking more in terms of vectors and SVG and, and uh, less in terms of bitmaps, I can really commend this talk, uh, Leaving the Pixels Behind, um, which I'll uh, tweet out after this, uh, a great talk that was given at Artifact last year, again from uh, the Filament Group, so one of uh, Patty's colleagues there. So in a nutshell, Ditching the slow, the photos, the complexity, the, the unwanted carousels, and switching over to fast items, uh, vectors, simple flat illustrations, and so on. All of these things will really reduce the amount of data uh, on your page um, and, and therefore the carbon footprint. I uh, wanted to leave us with a couple of examples here, uh, just uh, practical examples. Um, let me see how I'm doing here. Am I down to one last minute? I've got a couple more minutes, I think. Um, so a couple of examples here of people doing these types of optimization out in the real world. Here's another conference, uh, Deconstruct, uh, September 2013. This is their conference website. So it's got some of the things you expect from a conference homepage. It's got all the, the speaker photos. It's got uh, a web font uh, and some nice details. But this page is only 154 kilobytes. It takes under a second to load. And it's going to have a tiny carbon footprint as a result. They've been very canny in their application of uh, these types of design optimizations. They've selectively blurred the photos. Even though they're big photos, only the eyes are actually in focus if you, if you pay attention. Still gives a very powerful effect, but the images themselves are teeny tiny. They've only used one web font, and it's very well optimized. And they're using SVG vector art uh, for their logos and background art. And again, that means a teeny tiny 
file size as well. If you run it through Firefox's 3D view, you can see that their code is very clean as well. It's a very flat structure with the HTML. OK, well, fair enough. Those guys are, are um, uh, you know, a premier design and a UX agency, so you'd expect them to get that right. Um, but uh, we're also seeing this uh, out in the world where, where uh, real performance matters. Uh, MailChimp um, have done a really good job of optimizing their uh, product, uh, main product homepage here. So uh, it's even got a little animation on it. Um, again, powered by SVG. This whole page is only 500 kilobytes. Takes a second and a half to load, and it's very slim, streamlined. Again, SVG was the uh, the thing powering that. Uh, a couple last ones here. Um, this was doing the rounds a couple of years ago. This is a web page. This is a manifesto uh, for like slimline web design or like no design web design. That's a 19 kilobyte page. Takes a tenth of a second to load. Um, a good chunk of that is Google Analytics, of course. But that's how you. This is really a kind of demonstration of how low can you go. And then, of course, there's our own humble website, just seven kilobytes, no analytics there. Um, kind of extreme, but uh, just wanted to make the point that if you want to do really low carbon design, you just need to strip things back to their absolute essentials.